very good to see Brad and Blair South and Jade and Hartley and for the first time ever Tay. So we're glad to see that Tay has decided to make uh, worship with God's people an important part of his week. Um, so congratulations and good to see you guys again. Turn to Jude chapter 1. There's only one chapter. Verse 11. If you've noticed that the sermons have been somewhat um, negative in the last few months or weeks, I, you're not alone. Uh, Jude really spends a lot of time warning. It's a short book, but most of it is his warning. Warning about these people, these bad actors, these who are sneaking into the church, creeping in, who are opposing the gospel, who are proud and arrogant. And the warning goes both ways. It's a warning that we would watch out for these people, but also a warning we would not follow them or we would not be like them or be them ourselves. And Jude saves the punch of application till the very end, where he sort of shifts from warning to, so what do we do as opposed to them? So we were getting to that, but it is important that we take to heart the sobriety of the warnings. It is important that we pay close attention and that we even go slowly through them as we're seeking to work this out. So I'd like you to read verse 11, which is one of the most one of the strongest warnings in the entire short book. Verse 11. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us today, that we would be able to understand the warning here, the serious and sobriety of it, that it is important that we hear that woe, that judgment with not only our ears, but with our hearts and minds, that it would, to a degree, chill us as it would of these first century readers. I pray that today the application of this unique verse would be plain and obvious and received. May your spirit do his work. In Jesus' name, amen. The greatest threat to the mission, kingdom, health of God's church is not political activists, selfish governments, invading armies, but carnality, selfishness, and unbelief from within. That's the greatest danger that we face as God's people. There are bad actors, that is those who have devious motives, who are either deceivers or deceived themselves within the church universal and often within the church local. And Jude is warning about these enemies of the faith, as he calls it. Those who oppose gospel truth, not necessarily only with or primarily with their mouth, but with their lives. He describes them in colorful details through most of the book. And the reason he does that is so we will be able to mark and avoid them, and so we'll not become like them. In this text, we have in chapter, uh, verse 11... We have three examples that these bad actors are like, that, they, that, that represents them from biblical history. We have Cain, we have Balaam, and we have Korah. Last week, we spent the entire sermon just really going back and what is, who is Balaam and what was that all about, because it's the lengthiest one. So we're not going to spend much time in that. But we are going to look and read these other two accounts, and that will take a little bit of our time this morning, but they're a little shorter, so I think it's important. So I'm going to ask you to turn back to Genesis chapter 4, because Jude warns us to be careful of those who go in the way of Cain. So what is the way of Cain? Genesis chapter 4, 
I'm going to read this text and make some comment as we go through it, and then we'll move on to the next one, to Balaam, and just talk about Balaam for a moment, then, then to Korah, the text there. Genesis 4, of course, this is very early on. Now, Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering to the fruit, from of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering, and Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. We don't have in inspired scripture the reason for, the explicit reason for God's acceptance of Abel's, but not his acceptance of Cain's. And so scholars and commentaries all abound in their reasons why. What we do have, though, is the implication throughout the rest of scripture and theology that the uh, sacrifice early on, the sacrificial system was a way to represent or to express faith in God's promised deliver the seed to come, and the fact that the soul that sins it will die, and the life of the flesh is in the blood, and so a sacrifice where blood is shed as an innocent for the guilty is the symbolic nature of sacrifice, and so it seems that that's the main reason. Cain doesn't give a animal sacrifice. He doesn't represent what God had intended to represent. And lest we think it seems unfair, there's a lot the scripture doesn't tell us about what's happening here. For example, we have Adam and Eve being kicked to the garden, and then we have them having a kid, and then within a verse, he's an adult. So there's an awful lot that goes on that we don't read about, right? So I'm sure God communicated this. He did actually speak very audibly and directly to Cain after the fact. But the Lord says to Cain in verse 6, Why are you angry and why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you and you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with his brother Abel, his brother. and, And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. Now, the theology here is very interesting. It's the same sort of curse that God gave Cain's father, Abel. I mean, Adam, right? It's that curse, the ground is not going to yield fruit to you. And this is a theme in the story. It's the idea, it's actually in the Genesis account, it's reminding us that the curse passed on from Adam, that it went to the next generation. Now, Cain's insolence is amazing. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. His brother's dead, And the fact that the earth is not going to give him a good harvest is too much for Cain. Let that sink in for a moment, the sort of arrogance and insolence in that. I wonder what Abel would think about that curse of actually being alive and getting to till the ground. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth, and it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. So God is merciful to Cain. The Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Any theologian who tells you they know what the mark of Cain on Cain is, is lying. We have no idea what it is. And that's not even an important part of the story. It's just a mark on Cain, not even Cain's descendants. It's just Cain. This is the way of Cain, right? We're going to get to that in just a moment, but it's very clear that we can learn a lot of lessons from the way of Cain. James actually uses the story of Cain to describe how one who hates his brother is not a true believer. Um, If we could jump ahead, we could see the theological lesson in Genesis 4 may have something to do with redemption because you notice in chapter 4, Eve says, when she bore Cain, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Someone from Adam? 
And then if you actually look, look when Seth is born in verse 25, Eve says, I have gotten a seed from God to replace. And remember the promise to Eve about the seed? So she recognizes that the firstborn son is just the same as Adam. <laughs> But now there's hope because perhaps through Seth there's a seed to come. And that seems to be the theme, the theological theme of Genesis. But what does Jude do with it? What does Jude do with it? Well, he simply describes it in comparison to these individuals who deceptively pervert God's grace and are insolent in their denial of Christ's or God's lordship. In other words, what I think we're supposed to, when we read Jude, we're supposed to think about with Cain, we're supposed to think about a man who is deeply in love. And Cain is a man who is deeply in love, deeply in love with himself. Everything about Cain in the story is about Cain, right? God, how dare you judge me for killing my brother, for me killing my brother? It's too much for me. God doesn't accept his sacrifice, and this makes him angry enough to not attack God, because who could do that, but to take out the competition in his mind? Here's a man who was so overwrought with himself that he doesn't even believe, and there's nobody else in the world besides his mom and dad. He doesn't even believe that he's done anything wrong with killing his brother, because after all, it was for his good. It was so that he could be enjoy God's presence his way. Here's a narcissist, clearly. A man who's deeply in love with himself. He des- I said, I, I deserve it. I demand it. I'll get it, even if I have to kill you for it. And then when I get caught, I don't deserve judgment for it. Balaam, the other example. Numbers 22 through 24, which we looked at last week. Remember, Balaam essentially was this prophet of the pagans, the Canaanites, who was proud and manipulative. And in the story, the sovereignty of God is the point, right? That God is sovereign even over Cain's wicked, or Balaam's wickedness. But Jude takes it and really focuses not on God's sovereignty, but on Balaam himself. And talks about the error or the wanderings of Balaam. And the emphasis here of Balaam, we looked at last week, both Peter and Jude, and I think even Revelation would imply this, the main thing we're supposed to see of the evil of Balaam is that he was a man who was deeply in love as well. He was in love with money. He was in love with wealth. It says here in Jude, he went after greedy gain, and in Peter, because of greed and covetousness. So Balaam is a man who is a lover of money and prosperity. And then we have this third example, and it's the rebellion of Korah. So once again, turn to that book that we don't read a lot, Numbers, cha- Numbers and turn to chapter 16. And this is a little bit more lengthy story, but I'm still going to read the whole thing. It's 50 verses. So I'm going to try to read it um, with expression so we don't just kind of uh, zone out. But just if there's one thing I could ask you to do while I read this, as you read it too, is consider... Um, the chilling nature of this account. This is a wild story. It's an account, it's true, but it's wild. Let me set the stage really quickly. Um, This is before uh, we read about Balaam. Okay, this is the beginning of the wilderness wanderings. This is after Israel refused to enter the promised land to go in to fight Jericho. And God then says you're going to wander for 40 years in the wilderness until you're, you die off and your children rise up to take the land. So, kind of get the idea where we're at. Now Korah, this is verse, chapter 16. The son of Ezar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi. Levi, the tribe that was dedicated to God, his temple people, the ones who not all are priests, but they are intended to... Um, promote the worship of God's people. In fact, it's the tribe that Moses and Aaron are a part of as well. With Datham and Abiram, sons of Eliab, and on the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of renown, important elders and leaders in Israel. They gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You take too much upon yourselves. For all the congregation is holy, 
Every one of them. And the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? Now, right away, there is some truth in what Korah is saying. Israel is all called holy before the Lord. That's true. They are all separated unto him. Um, at another time, Moses' father-in-law Jethro tells Moses, you're taking too much responsibility on yourself. You need help. But what he's really wrong in is he says, you take it on yourselves. Because God had appointed very audibly with like shining face, thunder, lightning, mountain on fire. <laughs> He'd let the people know that Moses was his prophet and his leader. So when Moses heard it, he fell on his face. And he spoke to Korah and all his company saying, Tomorrow morning the Lord will show who is his and who is holy and will cause him to come near to him. That one whom he chooses he will cause to come near to him. Do this, take censers, Korah and all your company. Put fire in them, put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord chooses is the holy one or the chosen one to lead the people. You take too much upon yourselves, you sons of Levi. And Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi, is it a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation and to serve them and that he has brought you near to himself, you and all your brethren, the sons of Levi with you? Are you seeking the priesthood also? We, we understand the sons of Levi were precious to God. There was a special nature about them. He, they didn't get a land when they went in because they were God's tie. They were his, his special tribe. He's saying it's not enough that God has given you responsibility and grace and privilege. You want more. Therefore you and all the company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that you complain against him? Moses truly was a humble man. They're accusing Moses, but he's concerned that they're mad at his brother. And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eli, but they said, we will not come up. They're not even going to go talk to Moses. Is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of the land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness that you should keep acting like a prince over us? Now, this one just floored me. Look at verse 14. Moreover, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor given us inheritance of the fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. He had brought them to the land flowing with milk and honey. And he said, go in. And they said, no. And so now they say, you didn't take us into the land flowing milk and honey. I tried. You refused. Moses said to Korah, tomorrow you and all your company will be present before the Lord, you and they, and as well as Aaron. Let each take his censer and put incense in it, and each of you bring a censer before the Lord. 250 censers, both you and Aaron, each with his censer. So every man took a censer, that's where they offered incense to God, put fire in it, laid incense on it, and stood at the door of the tabernacle of meeting with Moses and Aaron outside the tabernacle. Korah gathered all the congregation against them at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. It seems like this has gotten to be a bigger group now. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, you notice how he didn't talk to Korah and Datham and Abiram? Spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, separate yourselves from among this congregation so that I may consume them in a moment. Then they, that's the, all of the people there, fell on their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin and you be angry at the congregation? Moses is mediating for the people and Aaron's mediating for the people even though they're the targets of the people. So the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the congregation saying, get away from the tents of Korah, Datham, and Abiram. Moses rose and went to Datham and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spoke to the congregation, saying, Depart now from the tents of these wicked men. Touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sins. So they got away from around the tents of Korah, Datham, and Abiram. And Datham and Abiram came out and stood at the door of their tents with their wives, their sons, and their little children. Now, we can't really tell from the tone here, but if you look at it very carefully, this is a standing of defiance. They say, Fine. And this is after God has spoken and his glory has appeared. 
And Moses said, by this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of my own will. If these men die naturally like all men, or if they are visited by the common fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord creates a new thing, and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into the pit, then you will understand that these men have rejected the Lord. Now it came to pass, as he finished speaking all these words, that the ground split apart under them, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households, and all the men with Korah, with all their goods, so they and all those with them went down alive into the pit. The earth closed over them, and they perished from among the assembly. I don't know exactly what happened here. I mean, I I believe it's a miraculous thing. I, I don't... I believe it was something supernatural. What I mean is, I don't know if they went straight to the lake of fire, the Bible says is reserved for Satan and his angels, or if they went to uh, Sheol, hell, and then eventually, we'll, I, I don't know. But the emphasis seems to be that it was immediate and chilly. Then all Israel who were around them fled at their cry, for they said, lest the earth swallow us up also. And a fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering incense. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, tell Eleazar the son of Aaron, the priest, to pick up the censers out of the blaze, for they are holy and scatter the fire some distance away. He's actually going to make a memorial out of these censers to beat them into a, a cover, make a cover for the altar as a reminder of rebellion. Let's skip down for time's sake. Look at verse 41 because this is amazing. On the next day. Now, what would you do on the next day after you saw this? On the next day, all the congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. Saying, you have killed the people of the Lord. Kind of reminds me of Cain. The judgment is too great. Right? Now it happened when the congregation had gathered against Moses and Aaron that they turned toward the tabernacle of meeting and suddenly the cloud covered and the glory of the Lord appeared. Verse 30, 43, then Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of meeting and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, get away from this congregation that I may consume them in the moment and they fell on their faces. Sound familiar? So Moses said to Aaron, take a censer and put fire in it from the altar. Put incense on it. Take it quickly to the congregation. Make atonement for them. For wrath has gone out from the Lord. The plague has begun. Then Aaron took it as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the assembly. And already the plague had begun among the people. So he put in the incense and made atonement for the people. He stood between the dead and the living. So the plague was stopped. Now those who died in the plague were 14,700 besides those who died in the Korah incident. So Aaron returned to Moses at the door of the tabernacle of meeting, for the plague had stopped. Now, it's a lot there. I know, once again, that could be an entire sermon all itself of what is going on in this situation. But what you see is really you're supposed to feel this story. You're supposed to feel the effects of it and the rebellion against the Lord. Notice they rebel against Moses, but he keeps saying they're rebelling against the Lord over and over again. And these are the people, Moses and Aaron, who are keep consistently standing in the way, keep mediating and praying for the very people trying to get rid of them. But one of the chief features from Jude, he says, perished in the rebellion of Korah. I think Korah loved something as well. He loved power, influence, prestige. He already had a lot. That's one of the emphasis of the story. You're a son of Levi. God has separated you out. You're a leader. Notice the, how he, notice the effect of what Korah began. In the end, because of Korah, 14,700 plus the 250 plus the families die because of this man's love of power. These are the accounts. If you turn with me back to Jude, let's see what Jude does with them. Woe to them. Remember, woe, who I, hoy. Remember we talked about this last week? In this context, not really a curse as in I hope bad things happen to them. Rather, it's a pronouncement 
a divine pronouncement of certain judgment. Literally in the grammar there, you could read this, woe is theirs. Judgment is theirs. They own it. That's what they get. Because they have trampled the grace of God and denied Christ's lordship, what else do you have than the wrath of God if you've done that? What else does one deserve? To put it in a modern sense, woe to them is another way of saying to hell with them. But notice also in this text of what Jude does, it's very fascinating to me, the progression that he writes it in. He says, woe to them, for they have, these are the teachers that have come in and people that have come into the church. He says, they have gone in the way of Cain or walked in Cain's pattern. Just put that in your mind. They've walked, they've gone. And then notice, says here, the next verse, and have run greedily in the era of Balaam. Now, um, the New American Standard says, have rushed headlong. At the ESV says they have abandoned themselves. And the reason it's so colorful in the different translations is because it's a very unique and colorful word and it means, has the idea of one who has poured himself out. It's the same word used for the drink offerings. And the idea is that they've completely just given themselves 100% over to something. You're poured out. So it starts with they go, they walk, and then they pour themselves out, and then the last one is, and so they've perished, been destroyed. And there's a progressive element to what Jude is expressing here. They follow the example of self-love of Cain, completely give themselves over to covetousness, and finally, in their pursuit of power and rebellion, they've earned divine judgment because the scripture tells us, the soul that sins, it shall die. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. What is the explanation of this? We see what he's doing. Jude is making this sort of progression and he's getting, moving from Cain to Balaam to Korah and, and the progression seems obvious because it's, this order is not even um, historical. It should go Cain, Korah, Balaam but he does this because he's emphasizing the end of perishing at the end and the progression to that point. But there's one, it's one woe. It's a singular Whoa, it's, it's a singular word. But then three examples. And I think this is indicative that what we're looking at is actually one main ultimate problem. And we could look at the different angles and nuances of Cain and Balaam and Korah. But he says a one singular woe to all three. And what he is expressing is there is one main thing that characterizes these three examples. And these individuals who follow them. And this is simply what it is. These three, because of who and what they loved, chose to live their lives without reckoning with God. They chose to live their lives without reckoning with the authority, righteousness of a holy God. They were, as the text told us earlier in Jude, godless, ungodly. They are the fools of psalms that say, no, God, that live their lives that way. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's the description. I mean, just think through that with me for a moment. The way he talked to God, there's no fear of God there. Balaam trying so desperately to cajole and manipulate God to give, to curse God's people and then make a profit out of it. And then Korah and his companions in defiance until the earth swallows them up. There's no fear of God there. Now, if that isn't a a, a representation of our entire culture today, I don't know what is. No fear of God. Fear a lot of things, a very fearful world we live in. But God doesn't seem to be one that people fear. 
even though he's the only one we ought to fear. But there is also connective tissue. In other words, why these three to teach this lesson of the fear of God? I'm going to spend the rest of our time essentially looking at five connections that these three have, and then five words of application of warning for us from that. First of all, notice that each one was a leader in some way. Each one was a leader in some way. Cain, the oldest brother, firstborn, representative of his father, Adam. Balaam, a prophet, religious leader. Korah, elder in Israel, son of Levi, community, religious, and political leader. They're all leaders in some way. Two, each is quite arrogant and insolent, if not only in word, also activity. I already mentioned this, but just remember, Cain believes he has the right to murder his brother, his only living relative, besides his mom and dad, because, why? Because he stood in his way, in some way, and then has the audacity to essentially blame God for his hardships, arrogance, pride. Just read the story of Korah, tries to usurp Moses. Moses? I mean, if by now, and you're part of those that have come out of Egypt, you should know that God's man is Moses, right? <laughs> should know that. You should have known that with the plagues. Should know it with the guy that could actually pick up and throw his, um, his rod down and it turns into a snake and can pick it back up. Should have known that when he raised his rod over the Red Sea and it parts. Should have known that when he comes down from Mount Sinai and the thunderings and the lightnings and his face is shining and glowing. It should, should know that by all the previous plagues that happened when people disobeyed and complained against Moses. But arrogance. So one, they're each a leader. Two, they're each quite arrogant. And three, each is moved by personal gain. Each is motivated by getting something. Cain, his access to God. He, often in the story it says, but the problem is I'm driven from your presence. I'll be driven from your presence. See, he was old enough to be taught a lot about the fall, I'm sure. And the presence of God is what Adam and Eve lost. And he recognizes the curse of that. But his self-fulfillment, I've come to God, I've wrangled God, I've come to him my way. Balaam, money, Second Peter 2 makes that the most clear. And Korah, power. Self, money, and power. Things haven't changed too much, have they? This is what motivates them. They're moved by personal gain, by covetousness and greed. Interestingly, another point, the fourth point about them, the connective tissue, is each is manipulative in their own way. Cain seeks to manipulate God by portraying himself as the victim. Seeks to manipulate his brother. It's, it indicates from the story, says they were gathered in the field and then he rose up to kill him. It doesn't sound like premeditation in the text. Balaam seeks to manipulate Balak and Israel and God and everything. And he eventually, right, succeeds to a degree. He gets Israel to curse themselves by manipulating the marriages of the people and the sexual license. Korah seeks to manipulate the people. He doesn't just come to Moses himself. He comes and he's gathered his group behind him. We, I've loved that always in my life as a pastor. People say, pastor, we have some things to say to you. A group of us have been thinking, and I'm like, okay, where's the group? <laughs> People do that when they want to manipulate. They'll, they'll make themselves bigger than they are. They'll make themselves more important than they are. So they can manipulate and kind of coerce into following. And Korah does that. He gets 250 behind him and seeks to manipulate the entire congregation in a coup against the Lord's prophet. And then finally, this should be the obvious one from the text, each suffers a chilling judgment. Cain is driven from God's presence. Balaam is killed by the people he manipulated. Korah, the most shocking of all, everything with him is swallowed up into God's pit. 
So those five descriptions, I think, connect these three under this idea of godlessness. They're leaders, they're arrogant, they're moved by personal gain, they're manipulative, and they suffer judgment. I want to encourage you to remember those five. I know it's kind of hard. Remember those five because that's going to be the basis of our our application. Because what I want to do at this point is think, okay, what do we do with this? How How do we draw a bridge between not only Cain, Balaam, and Korah to the first century when Jude wrote this? That's what Jude does for us. He draws a bridge right between them. But it's, it's my job to draw a bridge between the first century and the 21st century. Like, what is going on? What do we do with this ourselves? Romans chapter 16, verses 17 and 8. I'm, gonna, 18, I'm just going to read these for you. It's when Paul closes his magnum opus of the gospel doctrine, the book of Romans. And he closes it with a warning. And he says this, Now I urge you, brethren... Note those or mark those who cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned. And avoid them. Mark them, avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ. They deny the Lordship of Christ. But they serve their own belly their own passions. And by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple or the uninformed. That's what that means. Doesn't that sound like Paul could have been talking about the people in Jude? Or could have been talking about Cain and Balaam and Korah? Mark them and avoid them. And I know that a part of the application whenever we see God's text is for us to say, don't do this, you know, we don't be like this when it's a negative, like, like command against it, so don't. But what I want to do in most of this application is assume that for the most part, and I do assume this, that we as God's people, we don't want to be like them. That's not, that's not where the main warning is going to land with us in Grace Baptist. We're going to say, oh yeah, you're right, I, I am, I'm too much like Cain, or I'm too much like Balaam, or I'm too much like, that's probably true in our hearts to some degree, but I, what I want to do is I want to actually say there are bad actors, there are Cains and Balaams and Korah, they are out there and they are sneaking into this church. It's the nature of it. I don't say that because I found them. I say that because Jude warned us about it. Okay? So I want us to look at warning signs, to think of warning signs of what sort of people that we in our church and in our families need to mark and avoid. Now, this is with the obvious caveat that as default, we as God's people need to have welcome, open hearts, not cynical and jaded Not seeing destruction around every corner. Have true joy of the Lord. But this is here also. And and so we ought to receive our true brothers. Romans 14, welcome them. Bring them in. We ought to have a warm heart to people. But also, watch for the warning signs of abusers and deceivers and divisive apostates and heretics. Watch for these red flags that will come flying up through Cain, Cain and Balaam and Korah. What are some warning signs then? Red flags, five red flags from the five connective tissue things, five red flags. First of all, watch with a red flag, have you warned for those who pursue authority leadership? Now, the scripture is interesting about those who pursue leadership or authority in the church. One, it says if a man desires the office of a bishop or an overseer, he desires a good work. So it's not wrong to desire to be an overseer in God's people. It's not wrong to be a pastor and to desire that sort of thing. But James 3 also tells us and warns us, my brothers, do not be, many of you become teachers. There's a greater judgment. And so there's sort of this two-handed sort of warning. On one hand, great, you want to become a leader in God's people? You want to lead a Bible study? You want to lead a Sunday school? You want to become an elder or a pastor? Good. But be careful that you want to become that. Watch out for that. Specifically, I would apply it this way. Those who push hard for leadership. Those who like to tell people what to do. Like to be the boss, the leader, as they understand leadership. 
maybe not a biblical understanding of it. Those who like to be heard and seen. Those who are not content to teach the small group but say, that's too small for me. I need bigger. I need better. I need more people. Those who push for leadership, watch out. Be warned. Number two, And this is maybe a little more general or specific. I'll try to get some detailed application here. But watch for marks of arrogance and pride in their reactions and demeanor. Now, we know that's hard because we all struggle and suffer with marks of pride and arrogance in our lives. It's the root sin of humanity, right? We're proud people. But just some examples to think about. This is not exclusive or or even, even enough, but... Are those who then would be leaders or those who you would listen to, are they gentle? Are they slow to speak and slow to wrath? The scripture says easy to entreat. That means you can listen to them because you know they care about you when they speak to you. I mean, you can see Cain didn't care about his brother. He didn't care about God. Balaam only cared about padding his pockets. And Korah, he cared to be heard. I've often said this in a very practical way with individuals who are wanting to speak and preach God's word and teach. It's a good thing, but do do you want to speak because you have something to say or because you believe God has something to say? And And that's important. Do they often blame others? That's a mark of pride. Blame others, like Cain. Romans 12, 16 tells us to not associate with the high-minded, but with the lowly. When that essentially is, hang around people that nobody expects you to hang around. Sort of leadership or individual who looks for the ones who are dressed a certain way, or those who appear to be leaders themselves, congregates with these, this group, because they feel like there's some networking to be done. Watch out. Celebrity, culture, evangelicalism, I wish would just die a quick and painful death. Famous preachers and pastors, and oh, we're going to this one because this guy's the speaker, and that guy. I just wish it would go away. It's caused more harm than anything else. By the way, a lot of that celebrity culture in Christianity is driven by people, not even necessarily the leadership. We tend that way. We just naturally go that way. Appreciation so easily and quickly turns into adulation. Adulation so quickly turns into worship. Name dropping. Ever been around a name dropper? Well, back when I used to work with, and they named somebody that everybody would know in some like famous thing, oh, you know that guy? He used to be a senator. Well, yeah, we used to hang out and go golfing a little bit. Name dropping is one of those features of those who, like Korah, right? We are the sons of Levi. Watch out for that. Then with Korah and, and the people, one thing came out of that is, are they known with a discontented, grumbling heart? Watch out for those who make Everything's a problem. Everything is a horrible situation. There's no joy there. It's just grumbling and complaining. That's a mark of pride. Number three, so those who push leadership, those who have proud actions and reactions, those who are covetous. This also is one that sometimes is hard to see at first. A personal or physical gain moves them. And I, and I know this is sort of not very, um, this is very, very personal or I, I can't think of the word, nuanced. But what makes their eyes light up? Right? You, you know what I'm talking about. When you are around somebody and they start talking about their passion and they just, they're like, they, they smile, they're light up, they, they speak of that. What makes these people's eyes light up? Money, politics, fame, whatever it is. 
Does money and power and prestige alive in their eyes? Do things occupy them? There are so many rebukes and warnings in Scripture for those who would lead God's people that they not be greedy of, and here's the old King James Version, filthy lucre, greedy of gain. Watch out. Do they assume they have special access to God? This is often one of the ways, or at least deserve it, like Cain, that they are covetous for that personal gain. Are their interests primarily on their health, their happiness, their safety, their security? Or, or are they primarily interested in other people? Covetous, looking for personal gain. And fourth, manipulation. This is a problem, a major problem and I know in all of our lives, but in contemporary Christianity. And this comes from something worse in the heart. Manipulation is the evidence of something in the heart. Today, many use lust and abuse, sexuality, emotional, spiritual abuse, for example, to manipulate people to their cause, to their agenda, hide facts, twist things, only give part of a story to manipulate people that groom individuals. Often people will come and they'll groom children and women through gifts and favors and consistently manipulators will use scripture to justify or excuse wrong behavior. They'll weep and they'll apologize profusely. The waterworks will turn on and he just seems to mean so well. We have a problem in Christianity and what's called Christianity, the church as you could call it, because we are and ought to be people who welcome others and welcome sinners and welcome repentance and welcome faith and welcome confession, but abusers and manipulators know how to use that. And they prey upon people. One of the ways in which one of our Jude people of our era, and only use him again because it's an easy example, not to keep harping on this, but the well-known Ravi Zacharias found out through reports that he would um, tell people, tell women, that because he's a servant of the Lord, he wears out faster and has more struggles than most people because he's a man of God. So he needs those massages and that special affection. He manipulated people and used it in such a way and used the, I'm a man of God. Let's retire that term, okay? The man of God. People use it so much to manipulate and, and twist people. Watch out. Manipulators flatter and then gossip. They divide people in groups. People are a means to an end, a hurdle to overcome. And often they use their trials as a means to gain unusual pity or comfort. Kind of like Cain. Right? This is too much for me, my trial, my judgment. And then finally, I think the most obvious one, it's at the end, right? The fifth one. Watch for those that don't demonstrate a fear of God. Watch for those that don't tremble at God's word. Those that don't fear his judgment does the concept of a judgment from a holy God affect them in any way? Do, the, do they quickly confess and repent with sincerity and obvious turning when confronted with sin? Do they show true reverence to God and his people in their reactions and unguarded moments? Are they able to say, you're right, I'm wrong, I'm sorry? Are they able to humble themselves because they know that God is, is, is their judge? So mark these kinds of people that Jude is warning us about and avoid them. Don't follow them. Don't imitate them. Don't defend them. But I'd like to close with just a quick reminder that I've been doing every week and it's intentional. I want to tell you five ways, five reasons why you ought to follow Jesus instead. 
Because Christ was given all authority in heaven and in earth, yet he did not pursue one ounce of it. Everything was his, and yet he laid it aside. He didn't assert himself as king of the universe. He is the king of the universe. He humbled himself lower than any man ever has from the throne to the manger. These sort of people raise themselves up while Jesus lowers himself. He pursued self-sacrifice for our eternal gain. Not an ounce of covetousness and greed in Jesus. His own reputation, his power, his prestige was all what had been given to him. Nothing he took himself He even avoided it while on earth until his crucifixion. He said, don't say I healed you. Don't do this. Uh, Move from place to place. He always spoke truth, but never with manipulation. He didn't use people. He cared for people. He had compassion. He wept. He rejoiced. He was gentle and lowly, but true and bold with truth. As God the Son, he even feared God the Father. He teaches us the fear of the Lord. What do I mean by that? He emphasizes over and over and over again, I come to do the will of the Father. I come to do the will of the Father. And as one who feared the Father's will and one who understood divine judgment, he took that judgment on himself. And so our sin, my sin, is either on me or it's on Christ. So avoid people like Cain and Balaam and Korah. Put your hope and your rest in Jesus Christ. 